the ode less travelled, unlocking the poet within, written and read by Stephen Fry. The mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, the great teacher inspires. William Arthur Ward. For Rory Stewart, a good, superior, and great teacher. Forward. I have a dark and dreadful secret. I write poetry. This is an embarrassing confession for an adult to make. In their idle hours, Winston Churchill and Noel Coward painted. For fun and relaxation, Albert Einstein played the violin. Hemingway hunted, Agatha Christie gardened, James Joyce sang arias, and Nabokov chased butterflies. But poetry? I have a friend who drums in the attic, another who has been building a boat for years. An actor I know is prouder of the reproduction 18th century dueling pistols he fashions in a small workshop than he is of his knighthood. Britain is a nation of hobbyists, eccentric amateurs, Talented part-timers, pooterish potterers, and dedicated autodidacts in every field of human endeavour. But poetry? An adolescent girl may write poetry, so long as it is securely locked up in her pink leatherette five-year diary. Suburban professionals are permitted to enter jolly pastiche competitions in The Spectator and New Statesman. At a pinch, a young man may be allowed to write a verse or two of dirty doggerel and leave it on a post-it note stuck to the fridge when he has forgotten to buy a Valentine's card, but that's it. Any more forays into the world of poesy, and you release the beast that lurks within every British breast. And the name of the beast is embarrassment. And yet, I believe poetry is a primal impulse within us all. I believe we're all capable of it, and furthermore, that a small, often ignored corner of us positively yearns to try it. I believe our poetic impulse is blocked by the false belief that poetry might on the one hand be academic and technical, and on the other, formless and random. It seems to many that while there is a clear road to learning music, gardening or watercolours, poetry lies in inaccessible marshland. No pathways, no signposts, just the skeletons of long dead poets poking through the bog and the unedifying sight of living ones floundering about in apparent confusion and mutual enmity. Behind it all, the dread memory of classrooms swollen into resentful silence while the English teacher invites us to respond to a poem. For me, the private act of writing poetry is songwriting, confessional, diary-keeping, speculation, problem-solving, storytelling, therapy, anger management, craftsmanship, relaxation, concentration, and spiritual adventure, all in one inexpensive package. Suppose I want to paint, but seem to have no obvious talent. Never mind, there are artist supply shops selling paints, papers, pastels, charcoals, and crayons. There are how-to books everywhere, simple lessons in the rules of proportion and guides to composition and colour mixing can make up for my lack of natural ability and provide painless technical grounding. I am helped by grids and outlines, pantographs and tracing paper, precise instructions guide me in how to prepare a canvas, prime it with paint and wash it into an instant watercolour sky. There are instructional videos available. I can even find channels on cable and satellite television showing gentle hippies painting lakes, carving pine trees with palette knives and dotting them with impasto snow. Marl sticks, sable, hogshair, turpentine and linseed. Viridian, umber, ochre and carmine. Perspective, chiaroscuro, sfumato, grisaille, tondo and morbidezza. Reserved modes and materials, the tools of the trade a new jargon to learn, a whole initiation into technique, form, and style. Suppose I want to play music, but seem to have no obvious talent. Never mind. There are music shops selling instruments, tuning forks, metronomes, and how-to books by the score, and scores by the score. 
instructional videos abound. I can buy digital keyboards linked to programs that plug into my computer and guide me through the rudiments, monitoring my progress and accuracy. I start with scales and move on to chords and arpeggios. There are horsehair, rosin and catgut, reeds, plectrums and mouthpieces. There are diminished sevenths, augmented fifths, relative minors, trills and accidentals. There are riffs and figures, licks and vamp. Sonata, adagio, crescendo, scherzo and twelve-bar blues. Reserved modes and materials. The tools of the trade. A new jargon to learn. A whole initiation into technique, form and style. To help us further, there are evening classes, clubs and groups. Pack up your easel and palette and go into the countryside with a party of like-minded enthusiasts. Sit down with a friend and learn a new chord on the guitar. Join a band. Turn your watercolour view of Lake Windermere into a table mat or t-shirt. Burn your version of Stairway to Heaven onto a CD and alarm your friends. None of these adventures into technique and proficiency will necessarily turn you into a genius or even a proficient craftsman. Your view of snow on York Minster, whether languishing in the loft or forming the basis of this year's Christmas card, doesn't make you Turner, Constable or Monet. Your version of Fiorelisa on electric piano might not threaten Alfred Brendel. Your trumpet blast of Basin Street Blues could be so far from Satchmo that it hurts, and your take on Layla may well stand as an eternal reproach to all those with ears to hear. You may not sell a single picture, be invited even once to deputise for the church organist when she goes down with shingles, or have any luck at all when you try out for the local Bay City Rollers tribute band. You are neither great artist, sessions professional, illustrator, or admired amateur. So what? You are someone who paints a bit, scratches around on the keyboard for fun, gets a kick out of learning a tune, or discovering a new way of rendering the face of your beloved in charcoal. You have another life. You have family, work, and friends. But this is a hobby, a pastime, fun. Do you give up the Sunday kick-around because you'll never be Thierry Henry? Of course not. That would be pathologically vain. We don't stop talking about how the world might be better just because we have no chance of making it to Prime Minister. We are all politicians. We are all artists. In an open society, everything the mind and hands can achieve is our birthright. It is up to us to claim it. And you know, you might be the real thing or someone with the potential to give as much pleasure to others as you derive yourself. But how will you ever know if you don't try? As the above is true of painting and music, so it is true of cookery and photography and gardening and interior decoration and chess and poker and skiing and sailing and carpentry and bridge and wine and knitting and brass rubbing and line dancing and the hundreds of other activities that enrich and enliven the daily toil of getting and spending, mortgages and shopping, school and office. There are rules, conventions, techniques, reserved objects, equipment and paraphernalia, time-honoured modes, forms, jargon and tradition. The average practitioner doesn't expect to win prizes, earn a fortune, become famous or acquire absolute mastery in their art, craft, sport or, as we would say now, their chosen leisure pursuit. It really is enough to have fun. The point remains, it isn't a burden to learn the difference between acid and alkaline soil or understand how f-stops and exposure times affect your photograph. There's no drudgery or humiliation in discovering how to knit, purl and cast off, snowplow your skis, deglaze a pan, carve a dovetail or tot up your bridge hand according to Akol. Only an embarrassed adolescent or deranged coward thinks jargon and reserved languages are pretentious and that detail and structure are boring. Sensible people are above simpering at references to colour in music, structure in wine or rhythm in architecture. When you learn to sail, you are literally shown the ropes and taught that they're called sheets or painters and that knots are hitches and back is aft and right is starboard. That is not pseudory or exclusivity, it is precision. It is part of initiating the newcomer into the guild. Learning the lingo is the beginning of our rite of passage. In music, 
Tempo is not the same as rhythm, which is not the same as pulse. There are metronomic indications and time signatures. At some point along the road, between picking out a tune with one finger and really playing, we need to know these distinctions. For some, it comes naturally and seems inborn. For most of us, the music is buried deep inside, but needs a little coaxing and tuition to be got out. So someone shows us, or we progress by video, evening class, or book. Talent is inborn, but technique is learned. Talent without technique is like an engine without a steering wheel, gears, or brakes doesn't matter how thoroughbred and powerful the V12 under the bonnet if it can't be steered and kept under control. Talented people who do nothing with their gifts often crash and burn. A great truth, so obvious that it's almost a secret, is that most people are embarrassed to the point of shame by their talents. Ashamed of their gifts, but proud to bursting of their achievements. Do athletes boast of their hand-eye coordination, grace, and natural sense of balance? No. They talk of how hard they trained, the sacrifices they made, the effort they put in. Ah, but a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? Robert Browning's cry brings us back, at last, to poetry. While it is perfectly possible that you did not learn music at school or drawing and painting, it is almost certain that you did learn poetry, not how to do it, almost never how to write your own, but how, God help us, to appreciate it. We have all of us, all of us, sat with brows furrowed, feeling incredibly dense and dumb as the teacher asks us to respond to an image or line of verse. What do you think Wordsworth was referring to here? What does Wilfred Owen achieve by choosing this metaphor? How does Keats respond to the nightingale? Why do you think Shakespeare uses the word gentle as a verb? What is Larkin's attitude to the hotel room? It brings it all back, doesn't it? All the red-faced blood-pounding humiliation and embarrassment of being singled out for comment. The way poetry was taught in school reminded W. H. Auden of a punch cartoon composed, legend has it, by the poet A. E. Houseman. Two English teachers are walking in the woods in springtime. The first, on hearing birdsong, is moved to quote William Wordsworth. Teacher one. Oh, cuckoo! Shall I call thee bird, or but a wandering voice? Teacher two, state the alternative preferred with reasons for your choice. Even if some secret part of you might have been privately moved and engaged, you probably went through a stage of loathing those bores, Shakespeare's, Keats, Owen, Eliot, Larkin, and all who came before and after them. You may love them now, you may still hate them, or perhaps you feel entirely indifferent to the whole pack of them, but however well or badly we were taught English literature, how many of us have ever been shown how to write our own poems? Don't worry, it doesn't have to rhyme. Don't bother with metre and verses. Just express yourself. Pour out your feelings. Suppose you had never played the piano in your life. Don't worry, just lift the lid and express yourself. Pour out your feelings. We have all heard children do just that, and we have all wanted to treat them with great violence as a result. Yet this is the only instruction we're ever likely to get in the art of writing poetry. Anything goes. But that's how modern poetry works, isn't it? Free verse, don't they call it? Vers libre? Yes. And in avant-garde music, John Cage famously wrote a piece of silence called Four Minutes Thirty-Three Seconds and created other works requiring ball bearings and chains to be dropped onto prepared pianos. Do music teachers suggest that to children? Do we encourage them to ignore all harmony and rhythm and just make noise? It's important to realise that Cage's first pieces were written in the Western compositional tradition in movements with conventional Italian names like Lento, Vivace and Fugato. Picasso's early paintings are flawless models of figurative accuracy. 
listening to music may inspire an extraordinary emotional response, but extraordinary emotions are not enough to make music. Unlike musical notation, paint or clay, language is inside every one of us, for free. We are all proficient at it. We already have the palette, the paints and the instruments. We don't have to go and buy any reserved material. Poetry is made of the same stuff you are listening to now. The same stuff you use to order pizza over the phone. The same stuff you yell at your parents and children, whisper in your lover's ear and shove into an email, text or birthday card. It is common to us all. Is that why we resent being told that there is a technique to its highest expression, poetry? I cannot ski, so I would like to be shown how to. I cannot paint, so I would value some lessons. But I can speak and write, so do not waste my time telling me that I need lessons in poetry, which is, after all, no more than emotional writing, with or without the odd rhyme, isn't it? Jan Schreiber, in a review of Timothy Steele's Missing Measures, says this of modern verse. The writing of poetry has been made laughably easy. There are no technical constraints. Knowledge of the tradition is not necessary, nor is a desire to communicate, this having been supplanted in many practitioners by the more urgent desire to express themselves. Even sophistication in the manipulation of syntax is not sought. Poetry, it seems, need no longer be at least as well written as prose. Personally, I find writing without form, metre or rhyme not laughably easy, but fantastically difficult. If you can do it, good luck to you and farewell. This book is not for you. But a word of warning from W. H. Auden before you go. The poet who writes free verse is like Robinson Crusoe on his desert island. He must do all his cooking, laundry and darning for himself. In a few exceptional cases, this manly independence produces something original and impressive. But more often the result is squalor, dirty sheets on the unmade bed and empty bottles on the unswept floor. I cannot teach you how to be a great poet, or even a good one. Damn it, I can't even teach myself that. But I can show you how to have fun with the modes and forms of poetry as they have developed over the years. By the time you have finished listening to this audiobook, you will be able to write a Petrarchan sonnet, a sapphic ode, a ballad, a villanelle, and a Spenserian stanza, amongst many other weird and delightful forms. You will be confident with metre, rhyme, and much else besides. Whether you choose to write on the stupidity of advertising, the curve of your true love's buttocks, the folly of war, or the irritation of not being able to open a pickle jar is unimportant. I will give you the tools. You can finish the job. And once you've got the hang of the forms, you can devise your own. The Robertsonian sonnet, the Jonesian ode, the Millerian stanza. This is not an academic work. It is unlikely to become part of the core curriculum it may help you with your English exams because it will certainly allow you to be a smart ass in practical criticism papers, if such things still exist, and demonstrate that you know a trochee from a dactyl, a tetzer from an ottava rima, and assonance from enjambement, in which case I'm happy to be of service. It is over a quarter of a century since I did any teaching, and I have no idea if such knowledge is considered good or useless these days. For all I know, it will count against you. I have written this because over the past 35 years, I have derived enormous private pleasure from writing poetry. And like anyone with a passion, I am keen to share it. You will be relieved to hear that I will not be burdening you with any of my actual poems, except sample verse, specifically designed to help clarify form and metre. I do not write poetry for publication. I write it for the same reason that, according to Wilde, one should write a diary to have something sensational to read on the train, and as a way of speaking to myself, but most importantly of all, for pleasure. This is not the only work on prosody, the art of versification. 
ever published in English, but it is the one that I should like to have been available to me many years ago. It is technical, yes, inasmuch as it investigates technique, but I hope that does not make it dry, obscure, or difficult. After all, technique is just the Greek for art. I've tried to make everything approachable without being loopily matey or absurdly simplistic. I certainly do not attempt to pick up where those poor teachers left off and instruct you in poetry appreciation. I suspect, however, that once you have started writing a poem of any real shape, you will find yourself admiring and appreciating other poets' work a great deal more. If you've never picked up a golf club, you will never really know just how remarkable Ernie Elst is. Substitute tennis racket for Roger Federer, frying pan for Gordon Ramsay, piano for Jules Holland, and so on. But maybe you are too old a dog to learn new tricks. Maybe you've missed the bus. That's who. Thomas Hardy, a finer poet than he was a novelist in my view, did not start publishing verse till he was nearly sixty. Every child is musical. Unfortunately, this natural gift is squelched before it has time to develop. From all my life experience, I remember being laughed at because my voice and the words I sang didn't please someone. My second grade teacher, Miss Stone, would not let me sing with the rest of the class because she judged my voice as not musical, and she said I threw the class off key. I believed her, which led to the blockage of my appreciation of music and blocked my ability to write poetry. Fortunately, at the age of 57, I had a significant emotional event which unblocked my ability to compose poetry, which many people believe has lyrical qualities. So writes one Sidney Madwed. Mr. Madwed may not be Thomas Campion or Cole Porter, but he believes that an understanding of prosody has set him free and now clearly has a whale of a time writing his lyrics and verses. I hope listening to this audiobook will take the place for you of a significant emotional event and awaken the poet that has always lain dormant within. It is never too late. We are all Opsinath. Opsinath, noun, one who learns late in life. Let us go forward together now, both opsimathically and optimistically. Nothing can hold us back. The ode beckons. How to listen to this audiobook. There's no getting away from it. In about five minutes' time, you will start to find yourself, slowly at first, and then with gathering speed and violence, under bombardment from technical words, many of them Greek in origin, and many of them perhaps unfamiliar to you. I cannot predict how you will react to this. You might rub your hands in glee. You might throw them up in whatever is the opposite of glee. You might bunch them into an angry fist or use them to hurl this CD as far away from you as possible. It's important for you to realise now, at this initial stage, that, as I mentioned in my foreword, most activities worth pursuing come with their own jargon, their private language and technical vocabulary. In music, you would be learning about fifths and relative majors. In yachting, it would be boom spankers tacking into the wind and spinnakers. I could attempt to translate words like I am and caesura into everyday English, but frankly that would be patronising and silly. It would also be very confusing when, as may well happen, you turn to other works on poetry for further elucidation. So please, do not be afraid. I've taken every effort to try and make your initiation into the world of prosody as straightforward, logical and enjoyable as possible. No art worth the striving after is without its complexities, but if you find yourself confused, if words and concepts start to swim meaninglessly in front of you, do not panic. So long as you obey the three golden rules below, nothing can go wrong. You will grow in poetic power and confidence at a splendid rate. If you already know, or believe you know, a fair amount about prosody, sometimes also pronounced prosody, that is to say, the art of versification, then you may feel an urge to hurry through the early sections of the book. That is up to you, naturally, but I would urge against it. The course is designed for all comers, and it is better followed in the order laid out. Now, 
I'm afraid you are not allowed to listen any further without attending to the three following golden rules. Rule one. In our age, one of the glories of poetry is that it remains an art that demonstrates the virtues and pleasures of taking your time. You can never read a poem too slowly, but you can certainly read one too fast. Poems are not read like novels. There is much pleasure to be had in taking the same 14-line sonnet to bed with you and reading it many times over for a week. Savour, taste, enjoy. Poetry is not made to be sucked up like a child's milkshake. It is much better sipped like a precious malt whiskey. Verse is one of our last stands against the instant and the infantile. Even when it is simple and childlike, it is to be savoured. Always try to read verse out loud. If you are in a place where such a practice would embarrass you, read out loud inside yourself, if possible moving your lips. Amongst the pleasures of poetry is the sheer physical, sensual, textural, tactile pleasure of feeling the words on your lips, tongue, teeth and vocal cords. It can take weeks to assemble and polish a single line of poetry. Sometimes, it is true, a lightning sketch may produce a wonderful effect too, but as a general rule, poems take time. As with a good painting, they are not there to be greedily taken in at once, they are to be lived with and endlessly revisited. The eye can go back and back and back, investigating new corners, new incidents and the new shapes that seem to emerge. We are perhaps too used to the kind of writing that contains a single message. We absorb the message and move on to the next sentence. Poetry is an entirely different way of using words, and I cannot emphasise enough how much more pleasure is to be derived from a slow, luxurious engagement with its language and rhythm. Rule two. Never worry about meaning when you are reading poems, either those I include or those you choose to read for yourself. Poems are not crossword puzzles. However elusive or difficult the story or argument of a poem may seem to be, and however resistant to simple interpretation, it is not a test of your intelligence and learning, or if it is, it is not worth persevering with. Of course, some poems are complex and highly wrought, and others may contain references that mystify you. Much poetry in the past assumed a familiarity with classical literature, the Christian liturgy and Greek mythology, for example. Some modernist poetry can seem bloody-minded in its dense and forbidding allusion to other poets, to science and to philosophy. It can contain foreign phrases and hieroglyphs. There are literary and critical guides, if you wish to acquaint yourself with such works. For the most part, we will not concern ourselves with the avant-garde, the experimental and the arcane. Their very real pleasures would be for another occasion. It's easy to be shy when confronting a poem. Poems can be the frightening older children at a party who make us want to cling to our mothers. But remember that poets are people, and they have taken the courageous step of sharing their fears, loves, hopes, and narratives with us in a rare and crafted form. They have chosen a mode of expression that is concentrated and often intense. They are offering us a music that has taken them a long time to create, many hours in the making, a lifetime in the preparation. They don't mean to frighten us or put us off. They long for us to read their works and to enjoy them. Do not be cross with poetry for failing to deliver meaning and communication in the way that an assemblage of words usually does. Be confident that when encountering a poem, you do not have to articulate a response, venture an opinion, or make a judgment. Just as the reading of each poem takes time, so a relationship with the whole art of poetry itself takes time. Observation of rule one will allow meaning to emerge at its own pace. Rule three. Buy a notebook, exercise book or jotter pad and lots of pencils. Any writing instrument will do, but I find pencils more physically pleasing. This is the only equipment you will need. No cameras, paintbrushes, tuning forks or chopping boards. Poets enjoy their handwriting, like smelling your own farts, W.H. Auden claimed. 
And while computers may have their place, for the time being, write. Don't type. You may as well invest in a good pocket-sized notebook. The moleskin range is becoming very fashionable again, and bookshops and stationers have started to produce their own equivalents. Take yours with you everywhere. When you're waiting for someone, stuck in an airport, travelling by train, just doodle with words. As you learn new techniques and methods for producing lines of verse, practice them all the time. Imagine the above-mentioned is the end-user license agreement to a piece of computer software. You cannot get any further without clicking OK when the installation wizard asks you if you agree to the terms and conditions. Well, the three rules are my terms and conditions. Let me restate them in brief. One, take your time. Two, don't be afraid. Three, always have a notebook with you. I agree to abide by the terms and conditions of this audiobook. Agree? Disagree? Agree? Good. Now you may begin. Chapter 1. Meter. Poetry is metrical writing. If it isn't that, I don't know what it is. J. V. Cunningham. Some very obvious, but nonetheless interesting observations about how English is spoken. Meet meter, the iamb, the iambic pentameter. You've already achieved the English language poet's most important goal. You can speak English well enough to understand this sentence. If this were a book about painting or music, there would be a lot more initial spade work to be got through. Automatic and inborn as language might seem to be, there are still things we need to know about it, elements that are so obvious very few of us ever consider them. Since language for us, as poets in the making, is our paint, our medium, we should probably take a little time to consider certain aspects of spoken English, a language whose oral properties are actually very different from those of its more distant ancestors, Anglo-Saxon, Latin and Greek, and even from those of its nearer relations, French and German. Some of what follows may seem so obvious that it will put you in danger of sustaining a nosebleed. Bear with me, nonetheless. We are beginning from first principles. How we speak. Each English word is given its own weight or push as we speak it within a sentence. That is to say, each English word is given its own weight and push as we speak it within a sentence. Only a very badly primitive computer speech program would give equal stress to all the words in that example. A real English speaker would say it much, but certainly not exactly as I have done. Some words or syllables will be slid over with hardly a breath or pause accorded to them. Others will be given more weight. Surely that's how the whole world speaks. Well, in the Chinese languages and in Thai, for example, all words are of one syllable monosyllabic, and speech is given colour and meaning by variations in pitch. The speaker's voice will go up or down. In English, we colour our speech not so much with alterations in pitch as with variations in stress. This is technically known as accentuation. English, and we shall think about this later, is what is known as a stress-timed language. Of course, English does contain a great many monosyllables, many more than most European languages, as it happens. Some of these are what grammarians call particles, inoffensive little words like prepositions, by, from, to, with, pronouns, his, my, your, they, articles, the, an, a, uh, and conjunctions, or, and, but. In an average sentence, these are unaccented in English, from time to time and for as long as it takes. I must repeat, these are not special emphases. These are the natural accents imparted. We glide over the particles, from, to, and, for, as, it, and give a little push to the important words, time, long, takes. From time to time, and for as long as it takes. Also, we tend to accent the operative part of monosyllabic words when they're extended, only lightly tripping over the ing and li of such words as hoping and quickly. This light tripping, this gliding, is sometimes called scudding. We always say British. We never say British 
or brit-ish. Always machine, never mashing or mash-ing. The weight we give to the first syllable of British or the second syllable of machine is called by linguists the tonic accent. Accent here shouldn't be confused either with the written signs, diacritical marks, that are sometimes put over letters as in the E of cafe and the U of Führer, or with regional accents, brogues and dialects like Cockney or Glaswegian. Accent for our purposes means the natural push or stress we give to a word or part of a word as we speak. This accent push or stress is also called ictus, but we will stick to the more common English words where possible.